All right. Um, then I guess we're ready to go. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our session today on the topic of um, the role of digitalization in shaping an education-led recovery for high quality and resilient education. Welcome, dear audience, um, here in the room and also um, on the screens. My name is Anne. As you can see, I'm, I'm not Larry Flanagan, who was initially um, hosting this, uh, this session here today. I'm a Berlin-based high school teacher and I'm also a member of the uh, Regional Education Union Board here in Berlin. And um, I have the pleasure to chair today's uh, discussion for you. To address our topic, um, we uh, invited um, those that live education at the forefront. Um, together with me, we have here um, representatives of students, representatives of teachers and academics and education personnel, and also representatives of education employers. I kindly welcome you to discuss with me today. Um, but first of all, we would like to invite you as audience um, before I introduce um, our, um, our panel to you, um, to take part in a little um, quest that we prepared for you. You will see um, a QR code on the screens and also find it on your chairs because we would like you to um, have a little poll together, like you to ask uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. All right, now you can see the code. Um, the two questions to get to know each other a bit better that we prepared for you are um, where do you come from and also what is your profession? So I see you're already scanning it, that's great. And um, as I switched um, the slides now, we might see the results coming in. So as we can see, our participants in today's discussion come from Hamburg and Denmark, Germany, United Kingdom, and also Canada. So a very diverse audience here. And what is your profession? That's interesting. So um, the first makes uh, edtech, so and then other, and then policymakers, but also researchers and students, NGOs, teachers, and social partners. So you can see who we are discussing with, who is our audience today. Great. Um, thank you. So now let's move to the core of our discussion. And let me just introduce um, a little bit the topic. During the last decades, um, the growing implementation of digital tools in education and learning pedagogies has profoundly changed the educational experience of students and professional teachers, school leaders, and other education employers. So in this context, also the experience of the COVID-19 has shed light on the importance of building back the resilience of our education systems. We had to painfully become aware once more that those with low socioeconomic status suffered the most during the pandemic, being left behind even further. For example, at my own school in Berlin, Neukölln, those who know Berlin a little bit know, know where it is, um, in the southern, former western part of the city, the parents' monthly data plan on their smartphones limited the students' access to education during lockdown and homeschooling. So if the data limit was reached, there was no access to homework anymore for my students. Studies like ISILs also show that ICT literacy and competencies are very unevenly distributed amongst our students, teachers, and schools worldwide. Countries like Korea and Denmark seem to have already entered another digital level, so to say, um, compared to Germany, for example, or Italy. So, as always in education, we are coming from a very diverse situation on the ground that we have to bear in mind as well as the aim to foster equal chances in educational success that also we have to bear in mind when we develop our visions on the future, what we want to do today. 
The aim of today's panel dis discussion is also to listen and to be open for each other's visions and build bridges between those who live education on a daily basis, find common goals which we will be crucial for quality education in educational-led recovery. It's my pleasure to first introduce uh, to you Ruben Janssens. He is a member of the Executive Committee of the European Students' Union. Ruben is also a PhD researcher in artificial intelligence and social robotics at Ghent University in Belgium. And um, Ruben, let me ask you first, um, the focus um, of your topics of your work concern the quality of higher education in Europe, with a particular focus on learning and teaching, digitalization of education. Based on your experience as a researcher and a student representative, which are the main challenges and opportunities of digital education from the perspective of students, also taking into account the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic? All right, thank you. Well, that's a very big question, of course, um, but I'm an optimist, so I'm, I'm going to start with the opportunities. I really believe that uh, digitalization and digital learning really has the potential to make education more student-centered, more accessible, more international, more flexible, and more well-rounded in general. Um, Digital learning really offers us to uh, offer a diversity in learning methods and learning resources to offer to the students to really better fit the students' needs and their context. And that's really what student-centered learning is all about. So that really offers us the opportunity to better achieve that in a, in a way that traditional tools really couldn't offer us. Um, so we can use these tools to personalize the learning path uh, for students. Uh, but, however, that comes with a lot of uh, requirements and challenges. Because in order to achieve this potential of digitalization, we need to fulfill a whole lot of uh, constraints and requirements so that be, uh, students are actually able to make use of all of these digital uh, resources. And first of all, I want to say this, that digitalization and digital learning can never be an excuse for reducing investments. Because I mentioned a lot of possibilities and opportunities that digital learning offers us, uh, such as making it more student-centered. But on the other side, often digital learning is also portrayed as a way to make our uh, education more efficient and more cost sufficient. Uh, but that's actually, um, that, that works the reverse way, because if you want to uh, reduce your investment by actually working with digital uh, learning tools, then uh, we're not going to be able to offer those opportunities to the students, because you need to put in the investment and you need to put in the resources and the time uh, to actually make good use of those tools to offer good education to the students. Uh, so what do we need to actually um, uh, surpass those challenges? Well, uh, we mostly need resources. In a, if a higher education institution uh, or any education institution in general wants to make use of these digital tools, uh, they need to have the infrastructure, of course. They need to have the good digital tools uh, that the students and the teachers are able to use, uh, but also make sure that those are accessible to students. Like you mentioned, uh, the personal context of a student is really important, especially it was during the pandemic, but it is in general that the students actually have the tools themselves, uh, have the internet connectivity, for example, the physical environment to actually access uh, the education itself that's incredibly important and that's all next to the fact that the institution itself of course needs the good infrastructure to offer those good digital tools um, but also next to this infrastructure we need skills because the students need to have the technical skills to make use of those uh, digital tools but they also need transversal skills they need to have uh, data literacy they need to um, actually uh, are able to, to engage in critical thinking uh, when it comes to everything that's offered to them digitally. But not, not only the students, also the teachers. That's incredibly important. They need the technical skills to make use of those uh, uh, digital tools that are constantly evolving at the page, pace uh, far more quickly than, than uh, teachers and anybody has ever experienced. But they also need those transversal skills, but importantly also the pedagogical skills. Uh, they need to be supported and trained in how to actually make use of those tools to design a digital learning environment uh, that uh, is able to engage with the students' context and needs. Uh, let me expand a little bit on what I mean by that, by how those digital tools uh, should be uh, used. As I said, we're able to personalize the student experience and the learning path uh, very much with those digital tools. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to increase the interaction, the discussion, and in general, the active participation uh, of students when making use of those, those tools. Because we saw that very much during the pandemic that we could use a lot of those tools uh, to 
offer learning kind of in a similar way. Uh, we had the live streamed lectures or the lecture recordings. Uh, we had chats and forums online, but we know that that's not as engaging as uh, real face-to-face -face interaction. So whenever designing those tools and making use of those tools uh, in education, we need to put this interaction uh, at the forefront between students themselves and between the student and the te teacher, of course. Um, so for this, relationships are very important. We need to have this trust uh, between all those participants, between the students and the teachers, and this mutual understanding uh, to make sure that the digital learning is actually able to achieve all of those opportunities that we talked about. Um, so it's really important that the face-to-face -face aspect and the digital aspect complement each other uh, when actually making use of those digital tools. And I'm going to finish off by saying something about data and artificial intelligence. Uh, as you said, I do a bit of research in artificial intelligence, but we see that a lot of those tools are really making use and diving deep into the data analytics, uh, learning analytics, um, any automated or not automated use uh, of analysis of this data. Uh, and that offers a lot of those opportunities that I mentioned about as well. It uh, allows us to personalize this experience, uh, to gain so many insights for the students and for the teachers and for anybody involved in this learning process. Uh, but it offers a lot of, uh, it, it has a lot of risks as well. Um, we have to uh, think about the data security and the privacy. We need to make sure that this data that's collected is collected in a way that uh, completely um, make, respects the student's privacy, that the students always remain the owners uh, of their own data. Um, but also, just like with digital learning in general, we need to uh, think about the pedagogical aspect of this, of how to actually make use of this data, uh, to make sure that the students are not constantly being assessed and constantly under pressure, um, to make sure that we respect their mental health as well. Those are a lot of uh, important aspects that I think are often overlooked uh, when thinking and talking about those uh, learning analytics and, and data analytics and AI methods uh, in education. So, as I said, a lot of opportunities, but a lot of risks and challenges that we really need to think about when designing the use of those tools. Thank you very much, Ruben, for this quick insight also, and also for mentioning the data security, which I think is, is really, really important if we talk about um, digitalization, of course. Martina Sirodolfo is Program Officer at the European Trade Union Committee, sitting here right next to me, where she's responsible for the policy areas on digitalization and occupational health and uh, safety. And I want to ask you, Martina, as ETUCE, you represent um, the voice of 11 million teachers across Europe and have been carrying out several activities um, on digitalization and also on artificial intelligence. And based on your experience as teachers' representatives, which are the main challenges and opportunities, same question, of digital education from the perspective of teachers, academics, and other educational personnel, also taking into account the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you, Anne. Uh, let me just start to saying that that's the first time that as um, a trade unionist representative at the European level, I get the chance to speak directly uh, with companies. Digital and technologies tech, are bringing challenges. I believe that's uh, the first opportunity because when we stay in our uh, bureau in Brussels and just talking among us, among teachers, and we express our, you, you might think, most of the time concerns on digitalization, we are actually not building together. So one of, of the key opportunities here is really to, to change the narrative and to come together and to listen to each other's needs and how can we understand together how we want to build uh, the resilience of our education system. So uh, as uh, for uh, teachers' uh, representative, we have been debating a lot on whether we should uh, consider uh, digitalization as uh, a digital era, as a digital revolution. Well, what I believe is that uh, however you choose to call it, If uh, who is making the revolution or the era is ed tech, while teachers most of the time are undergoing this revolution. That's the, and that's the key issue uh, from, from my perspective, because if we keep conceiving education and digital education as something uh, that should be addressed by only uh, engineers or mathematics, well, we will 
end in less than a decade in a world that will be mainly characterized by inequality, and that would be a lose-lose situation. And that leads me to one of the main challenges that we have been experiencing during the COVID-19. And COVID for us, uh, as trade union, has been a, uh, an important push to deal with the digitalization because uh, in the past, uh, trade unionists um, have had uh, other priorities. While with COVID, we understood now that, well, there, there won't be, uh, we will not go back to the previous normal. We will inevitably have a new normal that uh, will be um, dominated by digital tools. So uh, in, in, in this period of the pandemic, the main issues, uh, one of the main issues has been inequalities. I have heard yesterday some speakers saying that actually pupils in their home have performed better. But I would say, let's go on the ground and let's ask teachers how difficult it was to get, uh, to, to engage students, to reach out to them, without mentioning all the difficulties that teachers had uh, with pedagogies, online pedagogies related to students with special needs. Right, Ruben? So, in at least one or two years, we will have the results of what will be, will have been the learning loss, in particular for disadvantaged students and disadvantaged groups. So, uh, in, in this context, I do believe it's important that we have teachers on board. It, having all the stakeholders on board should be, should be a priority. Then other, um, other statements that I've heard and we hear on a daily basis is that uh, one of the problems when um, uh, implementing digitalization in education is that teachers are reluctant to uh, implement digitalization in their pedagogies. Well, I, I tried to put in, in, the, in the shoes of a, a teacher and Imagine if your manager comes to you today and says to you, well, as a, an immediate effect, as of today, you won't be a business developer anymore, but you will be a communication officer, right? And that's what happened to teachers during the pandemic. They were asked all of a sudden, well, you change your, your pedagogies, you change the tools you have been, been used so far, and you, you find a way out. Most of the time, uh, without support, without means, uh, and with, with support and means, uh, I, I do believe there should be a, um, a joint responsibility, in particular from education authorities. And here, <laughs> I, I totally agree with Ruben when he says that, well, COVID has been a uh, an opportunity from the perspective of education authorities that have seen through to, um, to use a cheap mean to deliver education. I was speaking yesterday with one of, um, with one of uh, uh, the representatives from uh, a, a company in, in, in France, and he told me, well, actually, it's quite expensive to deliver high-quality online teaching. So... Then we also need to clarify what we mean with digital education, because a clear distinction needs to be made between the experience that we have been living during the pandemic and the digital education that we want for our future. Because so far, we have been uh, asked teachers to apply their same skills and think about a teacher that had uh, their initial education like two decades ago without any possibility of continuous professional development, so for training. And when I, when I say training, we should not just consider a MOOC as a training, right? So let's think about the case of a normal teacher that find without means and needs to refigure the way they, they deliver education. So, continuous professional development, high-quality continuous professional development should be 
a key in the future. And it's a challenge, but at the same time, an opportunity because it puts us in the position to rethink the way we have been delivering education so far. So that was uh, just a kickoff <laughs> for, uh, in particular, to, to, to push also the, the audience for uh, an interaction and, and your views as well. Um, and uh, it, it would be very interesting also to hear from, from your perspective. Yeah, thank you a lot, Martina, for mentioning this perspective as well, the teachers and the, the employers' perspective. Um, that's, uh, yeah, I hope we, we will recur back to that in the discussion later on. And I think um, the next panelist uh, is Rodrigo Di Melo, um, Vice President of the EFEE, right? Ah, we can see you via video. Hi, welcome uh, to our discussion here in Berlin. Um, I will introduce Rodrigo Melo um, quickly to you. As I said, he's the Vice President of the uh, European Federation of Education Employers and also CEO of um, the National Confederation of Education and Training in Portugal. Rodrigo holds a degree in law and um, a PhD in education. Uh, he teaches and researches at the Universidade Católica Portuguesa. He is member of the National Educational Council and chairman of EGNIS as well. And um, may I ask you, Rodrigo, in 2018, you have co-authored the report Reshaping Schools for a Tea World and uh, on the challenge for schools brought, um, for, for the challenge brought to schools by the digital revolution. And... Uh, in your opinion, what are the main findings of this report in terms of opportunities and challenges for schools when dealing with digital education? And what is also that we would like, we would like to know also more about the situation in Portugal coming from your direct experience? Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Well, you know, what's very interesting is when we wrote the report in 2018, of course, we couldn't even imagine what was going to come with the pandemic and the lockdowns. And what I would like to highlight as the opportunities that the digital revolution and the pandemic together have brought to education systems is that now we know that it is possible to educate online. And I would say that what is most amazing about what happened during the lockdowns in all European countries was not the problems. Of course, there were a lot of problems in education, but it was the good things that went on. Millions of students, millions of teachers were online and the students learned. And so I would say that the first opportunity that we now have is that everybody knows that online teaching and learning is possible. Second new uh, opportunity we have is that very quickly, schools, teachers, students, even parents had to adapt. And so they developed new user uh, competencies of technology. So digital tools, uh, people are not uh, proficient yet, but a lot of people have come through the uh, phase of at least knowing how to work on a digital uh, environment. And the third opportunity is that because of the lockdowns, learning management systems got really better and platforms for interaction got really better. And so I think that, of course, we had a lot of problems, but still we could look at this as a, a, an opportunity. And the, the opportunity of integrating digital tools and a digital mindset into education is firsthand an opportunity to change the pedagogy. You cannot teach online, as we all understood very clearly, as you teach in a classroom. I dare to say that even you should not be teaching in a classroom in the 21st century as you have done since the 19th century. And so we have here a very big challenge is that because digital tools allow us to communicate, to uh, retrieve information, to work with data in a much more efficient way, we should for once and for all think about developing more student-centered pedagogies. And so concepts like the flipped classroom that were already around in the pedagogical and the schools and this and that, but really nobody really took them very seriously in, a, uh, in, in, a big, in big numbers. Now we have understood that 
probably this is a, a way forward. And so a challenge is for schools and teachers to look, relook at the, the pedagogies we are using. A second big challenge, and it has all already been spoken by, by my predecessors, is uh, the need to make sure that we have the digital tools in place. And with digital tools, I am not thinking about the software, I am mostly thinking about the hardware, the devices. If we are to teach and learn in a digital world, every learner, every teacher needs to have access to the digital world. And the challenge here is that because of the pace of change of technology, it, we have to think in a systemic way, how are we going to upgrade devices every four years, every five years, whatever it takes. But so there is something we have to think on when we think about the way we manage resources in the education systems all around Europe, is that devices have to be available and devices will have to be upgraded or substituted every uh, four or five years. Then we have uh, very new technological challenges. And so artificial intelligence, if we have written about it in the 2018 report, will have a role to play in the future. But still, it's not about the artificial intelligence, it's about the big data that will support artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is just the sum of algorithms with big data. And the problem is not the algorithms, they are already invented, it's easy. The problem or the challenge is the big data. And here, it's a very humane issue. How do we collect big data about learners whilst at the same time making completely sure we are protecting the, uh, the personal data, the privacy uh, of the learners? And so I think in education, this issue has to be addressed sooner than later. Of course, the, the European regulation on data protection is important, but still, we have to think about this very carefully when we think about education, because at the same time, it simply doesn't make sense to say that artificial intelligence has to stay out of education because of the problems of uh, privacy and uh, big data. And finally, uh, what's interesting about Portugal and speaking with colleagues from all over Europe, I think, of course, this was not only in Portugal, there was a very big difference in the digital teaching and learning when the lockdowns occurred. On the one hand, we have a group of schools that were already very proficient in integration of digital tools in the, in the classrooms and school management and so on. And so for them, it was very easy to go into 100% digital. Other schools were halfway and other schools were still in the beginning. And so, of course, there were a lot of problems. And unfortunately, there were a lot of equity problems because as we all know, the biggest problems were with schools and families and teachers in more deprived contexts. And so, again, in coming back to the, the challenges, we have to find a way to make sure that access to the digital world is uh, granted for all. And I uh, stop with uh, just a, a personal story. I have several kids and during the lockdown, we were fortunate, of course, to have the computers and the access and all that. And fortunately, my kids' school, the teachers, uh, flipped the classrooms. And so the kids were working with each other and then presenting online. And they are all upper secondary and lower secondary students. And when we came back to face to face, of course, they wanted to be with their friends face to face. But then they again sat in class listening to the teacher. And so one week into the face to face, lessons they came home and said one day i am so fed up with all this i really wish it would lock down again so i can have more pleasure in the work i do instead of sitting in the classroom the whole day you know so i think this is the big opportunity and challenge it's changing the pedagogies thank you very much rodrigo for these interesting insights on digital education landscapes in portugal and the results of your study and also the the personal comments that you made at the end thank you very much um, i want to mention that in germany i'm, I'm from berlin um, we learned recently from a study that was conducted by a team at the university of Göttingen by a union funded research center 
that there exists a, a huge gap between our schools in terms of digitalization. So 12% would be what we would call digital lighthouses, um, which are already at the forefront of education in, in terms of digitalization. But more than 60% are only average or below. And um, also the pandemic fostered digital development, uh, mainly in, in the school administration, that's what they found, and also in terms of ba basic te teaching solutions. But um, in a, innovative pedagogical uh, concepts, like you mentioned, also collaborative tools, flipped classrooms, simulations, and uh, others, are still rather an exception in everyday teaching. And that is what we are thinking of when we mean like changing um, the pedagogies and uh, adapting to digital solutions. And another interesting finding from the study is that 77% of the teachers want to foster digitalization, but their efforts are limited by poor digital infrastructure in schools and also due to insufficient public funding. So that is also something that we have to talk about. It's huge investments that are being made, and there is, um, it's, it's also in these terms um, a huge function that also the government, governments have on, on changing everyday teaching at the moment and a huge responsibility that comes with that as well for all of these involved. Something that the study also found was that those teachers who actively foster digitalization at their own schools would be less affected by what the researchers called digital stress. For example, what is digital stress? Being worried that the digital infrastructure in the classrooms would not work out when they want to start their lessons, or so they always had to plan uh, double, like analog and digital as well, that causes digital stress, of course. And um, to summarize, less digitalization in schools is causing more stress for the teachers, right? So, and speaking of these results, um, I want to introduce uh, Samira Bura to you who is a policy officer also at the European Federation of Education Employers. And she has been representing the education employer side in the framework of the project eSpeed, European Social Partners in Education Embracing Digitalization, Challenges and Opportunities for European Education Trade Unions, unions and Employer Organizations in the Digital Era. Samira is passionate about reflecting about the opportunities the future bears for school education, Right? in particular with uh, regards to the digital education. And let me ask you, Samira, um, based on your experience in, of education employers' representatives, which are, in your opinion, the main challenges and opportunities of digital edu um, education? Thank you, Anne, for this introduction. I'm, I'm so pleasured and um, so happy to be here today um, with, with my colleagues also sitting uh, beside of me. Um, before I, however, dive into your question, uh, which is very important one, um, I would like to shortly introduce uh, my organization so you have uh, kind of the context where I'm coming from. So bear with me for, for a moment. Um, so I'm from the European Federation of Education Employers. Uh, we represent uh, education employers and providers all over Europe. Um, in, um, uh, in total over 60 institutions from uh, 27 countries, um, covering all stages of lifelong learning from early childhood education until adult education. So we have all the, um, a global picture of all the challenges and opportunities which uh, these levels uh, face. Um, and our, um, our mission, which, which drive, drives us forward, is to how we can improve uh, the, the quality of teaching, of, of, um, of learning, of school management, so that um, learners who are present today, but also future learners, so that they can become active and responsible citizens uh, in societies and can engage with their um, uh, surroundings in a responsible and sustainable way. Um, and in this regard, um, the educational task uh, is, of course, with the education and training institutions. They have the what we call in, in German the, the Bildungsauftrag, uh, because, um, as you know, learners, students, they are they spend so much time in um, in these institutions. Um, however, the question is where the educational task, the Bildungsauftrag, is fulfilled these days. 
um, there's a huge uh, discrepancy between the theory and the practice. Um, also before COVID. So um, while the world is changing outside, where we have these radical changes with regards to digitization, all these uh, digital processes going on in the culture sector, for example, that uh, we have, uh, for example, um, cities replaced by streaming uh, services, or um, also in the uh, car industry, um, uh, which is uh, especially prominent in my region where I'm coming from. I'm from Stuttgart originally. Um, and there you also feel the automat uh, automation. However, if you go to the classrooms, um, the digitization is, is not really felt. Um, and therefore, we also, the, so schools are mostly still analog in this regard. Um, and we especially could feel this discipline discrepancy, the consequences of this discrepancy in the pandemic. So when teachers, uh, when schools, when um, school leaders, when they struggled um, with uh, the transition um, to, to manage it uh, efficiently uh, from on-site learning uh, to um, yeah, uh, digital learning. Uh, and also, we have uh, a huge uh, gap when it comes to um, skills. So approximately 42% of European citizens and learners, they lack basic digital skills. Also young people, um, also the ones who are called the, the so-called uh, digital natives. So the pandemic really has been a wake-up call. Um, where we can really say we need to change something, we need to uh, do something against this future mismatch of skills which are awaiting us so um, that uh, the future of uh, future learners and also present learners is not negatively affected. And now we have like this, this chance, this opportunity uh, with the lessons we have learned in the pandemic ahead of us to really say, how can we bridge uh, this gap? How can we really uh, bridge the, this learning gap? And how can we upskill and uh, reskill? Uh, how can we open up uh, reskill and uh, upskilling opportunities? In this regard, uh, digital tools, the fostering of digital tools in daily learning uh, is essential as it brings uh, personalized learning and flexible uh, learning with us. Um, in this regard, it's, it's essential to also um, realize that um, digitalization, for example, uh, brings about the opportunity to bring um, students on board to really foster inclusion in every possible way. Um, to also spark uh, the, the, the passion for lifelong learning again, um, as the uh, digital tools, for example, uh, can really, um, as an additional tool, um, foster like lifelong learning to recreate the spark, to um, to re uh, to um, to illustrate students why uh, to, why they are learning the things they are learning in the classrooms to re bridge the gap between the, the theoretical and the practical matters. For me, for example, uh, the question why was always important, but um, hard to answer in the classrooms because it was always about theoretical matters. Um, however, um, with the digital tools, we can really um, um, say, um, we can really tackle this issue and really um, spark this, this question again. Um, However, the, the challenge, of course, is uh, to, to connect the dots, uh, to really bring everyone on board, uh, which means also the, all the uh, educational sectors, all the educational levels, from primary education to um, adult education, to really uh, ensure that there's like a coherent uh, transition when, uh, when it comes to the fostering of the digital skills and the uh, uh, digital infrastructure. Um, my script says there was a video prepared. Is that still? Yes, that's, yeah? that's correct. <laughs> okay. Exactly. So um, the video which we would like to share 
with you right now is uh, a video we pr pr uh, produced in a framework of the um, project eSpeed, mm -hmm. which we manage in cooperation with um, our partner E2CE. Um, so in this uh, framework, uh, in this project, we explore the opportunities and also the challenges uh, which um, educational institutions and training institutions encounter these days. Uh, it was a wonderful project, uh, took two years, uh, where we had so many um, new um, lessons to learn. Uh, and in this regard, I would like to um, ask the technician to, to show the, the short clip which we prepared. <laughs> Digital technologies are bringing challenges and opportunities to our lives. In the last decades, they have rapidly transformed the world of work, with the education sector being one of the protagonists of this transformation. We have decided to launch the eSpeed project. With this project, European social partners in education have worked side by side to analyze the opportunities and challenges related to the use of digitalization in education for teachers, academics, other education personnel, and education employers. The eSpeed project has been initiated, I think, in 2019. At the time, we didn't really know yet about the, what's coming. We didn't really know about the COVID-19 crisis. We wanted to, um, to really to address the issue of digitalization from the perspective of the social partners. So the main focus of this project was really how the institution of the school will change because of the digitalization process and what should be our response to it in order to make sure that this digitalization process will really take place. Digitalization in education means more it meant two years ago before the beginning of the pandemics. It's not only support for um, education. Well, I believe that digital uh, media and the ability to, uh, to master uh, modern technology and also modern communication is vital to being a global citizen in the 21st century. In class, I use digital tools such as various calculus programs and graphic designs programs. The use of digital tools offers an unlimited possibility of access to information such as videos, scientific articles, programs or applications used for educational purposes. The uh, use of digital technologies can help students better understand subjects, supplement the usual classic way of teaching, there are many examples in which digital tools really made a difference. The possibility for students to review the classes several times to better understand the knowledge, participation in uh, various scientific events without traveling on large distance. I have Danish where my teacher has a PowerPoint but we don't use our computers that much. We just look at the screen and then we all talk about it together. I like that it's a combination of both because if I had to use my computer in every class, I would get very tired. It's very uh, dangerous to put the digitalization in the first, the first position. It's not a task. It's a very important instrument for our schools. It's not a goal in itself to use digital media, but it's a goal to use digital media to do what could not have done without digital media. For example, communicating and collaborating. Digitalization is an instrument for our university. It's very important to stay in front of the, of the equipment 
in the middle of the lab. But it's very important to use to use the digitalization in uh, in the future. Jeg ser en en fremtid for mig, hvor digitaliseringen kommer til at spille en lang større og også vigtigere rolle i uddannelsessystemet, end den har gjort uh, tidligere. Lærerne har været igennem en kæmpe kompetenceudvikling i forhold til at arbejde med digitale redskaber i deres undervisning. Og den skal vi finde ud af, hvordan bruger vi den klogt og uh, tankefuldt uh, i fremtiden. So this project has clearly shown that digitalization is only successful when approached as an integral part of the overall educational mission. That is why digitalization should be conceived as an integral part of quality, initial and continuing teacher training and not treated as a separate technical issue. The digitalization process is a is a positive development in the education sector. And we need to look into those things that we can really implemented the school context in order to enhance and in general uh, make the education more inclusive. And from the employer's point of view, this is the most important thing that we should achieve. Yes. Thank you very much for showing this video to us, Samira. And um, thanks uh, to all the panelists for addressing the first round of questions. We have another question prepared. We want um, to focus a little bit more in the second part of the discussion on the key elements that we need to, to build an education-led uh, recovery um, on that fosters inclusive, quality, and innovative education. And we want to make a quick round and then open to questions from, uh, from the audience. And um, Ruben, may I um, ask you first to answer the questions and elaborate a little bit more on the key elements that we might need now to develop for the future? Yes, of course. All right, for this question, um, I'm going to take you along the, the thought journey of how an institution, especially a higher education institution, of course, because that's my perspective uh, from the European Students' Union, how they should in an ideal situation think about digitalization. That's really about the implementation of a strategy for digitalization because we see from the European University Association in their latest report uh, that most institutions uh, in Europe already have a digitalization strategy or are actively working on one. But what does that actually look like and what does that look like ideally to actually unlock all of the potential of digitalization? Um, and for that, I, I think one of the things that was just said in the video uh, really resonates with uh, what we think about this here, is that digitalization is not a goal in itself. It should not be a goal in itself. Uh, rather, it's a tool to actually achieve uh, this access and increased uh, quality of education that we really want to uh, achieve with the digital tools. So then what should it be about? How should we think about using di those digital tools in education? Um, and the center of the, that thinking should be what is the impact on the learning of the students? Um, how can we use these digital tools to actually enhance the quality of education and enhance the accessibility of education? Um, in, or, in order to answer that question and really build such a strategy, uh, first we need to think about how can those digital tools and this digitalization enhance the learning of the students? Uh, what tools exist and what can we, um, what, what do we want to do with them? And then what's really important is thinking about how the students and all the stakeholders such as staff and teachers uh, can be involved in every step along the way. So in the design of this digital learning environment, in the design of the use of those tools, uh, but also throughout the way. So not in the beginning, just consulting with the students, but really taking them, them along as equal partners. Uh, also throughout the process, uh, having a continuous evaluation of those tools and of the effect of those tools. Um, and then as we talked about in the previous round of questions, uh, an institution should think about how the necessary resources uh, can be allocated. So we're talking about the infrastructure, as we talked about in the beginning, uh, both in the institution itself, but also for the students themselves in order to access uh, the digital tools, uh, but also the staff, the, the, the skills and the time and the resources to actually put in uh, to think about how to use those digital tools and to really design the entire learning and teaching experience uh, for the students. Um, and an important thing in this is also the connection with the companies and the, uh, well, the edtech companies that are actually developing those tools. And that's something that I, th I think I see is often kind of missing because you've got those institutions uh, with teachers, with professors uh, and students who are really yeah, uh, trying to make use and uh, to innovate with those tools. Um, 
but then they, they have to make use of the tools that exist. And there's often a really big disconnect uh, between the people actually making use of the tools and the people developing the tools, because you've got those huge, uh, often bureaucratic, administrative uh, higher education institutions uh, with professors that may have been there for a very long time and also don't only have education as their main task, but also are doing research uh, or community service uh, activities. Um, and then you've got those edtech companies that are, of course, trying to make a, a, a product uh, that can be used in many cases, uh, hopefully across the world. Uh, but what's really important is not only involving those stakeholders, such as students and teachers, uh, in the dialogue and in the process of designing uh, this learning and teaching using digital tools, but also uh, to really have a much better connection with the companies that are actually designing those tools. So to make sure that all of those uh, constraints that we talked about in the previous round, uh, the technical, the accessibility, the quality, the pedagogical constraints uh, can be addressed because we need to put the people that use them who are really the experts uh, on the pedagogy and on the uh, learning and teaching together with the people that make and design the tools. Um, and all of that is really uh, important to integrate in an entire evaluation cycle. We've got really big uh, and, and well-defined quality assurance procedures in higher education and some of the thoughts behind those, the values such as uh, student-centeredness, uh, such as continuous evaluation and involving the stakeholders really need to be extended to digital learning as well. Uh, we really we need to uh, put all of the digital learning and the tools uh, in those processes uh, and think about them uh, just as with regular le uh, learning and teaching. Uh, and with that comes, of course, also the access to the entire support structures uh, that should surround those uh, any learning and teaching environments, but also online. And that really extends, just like in the previous question, to uh, artificial intelligence and data analytics as well, because that's really all of the other stuff of, of digital learning uh, just uh, enhanced even more, because you've got a lot more power and a lot more data and a lot more responsibility as well uh, in that. And for that, we need to think about the same. We talked about privacy and ethics, and that's incredibly important uh, whenever making use of data. A special case that's gained a lot of attention during the pandemic is online proctoring. Uh, I'm not going to dive too deep in that because there's so much to talk about there, but there it's also uh, really important to think about the privacy and the ethics of what we're doing, why we're doing it, what data we're collecting. Um, and what we want to use uh, with that. And for that, uh, a continuous conversation between the students, the staff, the teachers, and the companies that are designing uh, the, the tools is really uh, important to make sure that we're on the same page and that we're actually able to integrate those pedagogical values and those ethical values that we want to have and to achieve the real opportunities of digital learning uh, and are able to do that with the tools uh, that exist and the tools that are being developed uh, continuously. Uh, so that's kind of the, the, my thoughts from a student students' perspective of how we can use uh, digitalization in a strategy, uh, looking forward to really uh, recover from, the, from this crisis, but also look at a sustainable uh, future where digitalization is going to play a big role uh, nonetheless. Reminding us to consequently follow a constructivist uh, approach to, to teaching and learning also on the terms uh, or when it comes to developing our tools, right? So that's a state of the art of the research uh, on, on teaching and, and learning, of course. Um, yeah, I would like to hand on the question to Martina as well. What are the key elements from your point of view? Thank you, Anne. Uh, I think the terminology of resilience here, yeah, it's a bit tricky because... If we look at the etymology of the word, uh, resilience uh, in its Latin etymology means jumping back. I don't think we should jump back. I think we should move forward. And in order to do so, we should first uh, find an agreement on which are our priorities. And from the teacher's perspective, I do believe we should all agree that inclusion and quality should be the core of education. Second, we should remind ourselves that education cannot be considered as a commodity. Education is not just a public service. Education is a human right. And in this sense, we cannot think and we cannot define teachers and students as users. They should and I might overlap with Ruben here, we should be co-creator of the digital tools that we are using today and we will use in the future. And I stress on the word tools because digitalization should not be a, core in its, uh, a goal in itself. Digitalization should focus in the future on pedagogies, 
I do believe we should focus on the impact that digitalization has on pedagogies of teachers and how we can make the best use of digitalization to improve pedagogical methods. I was asking some companies yesterday who trains your AI systems because that's crucial. Think about personalized, teach, uh, personalized learning. Who decides, uh, who trained the algorithm that defines the following content that I, will, that I will receive, that I will get in contact with? And the answer was, it's complicated. Well, <laughs> that, that's not the answer that we want. <laughs> we, we want uh, specialists uh, of pedagogies being part and uh, to ensure the accountability of the system. And, th and talking about AI, which is now in our daily life, transparency would be the key. I have not much hope that the um, AI uh, new regulation will be adopted any soon, but that would definitely be a step forward. And just to remind every one of us, in that, propo in that proposal of regulation, education is considered a high-risk level. Uh, still, when it comes to governance, where are teachers and where are social partners as well? So. Transparency, transparency in the process would be uh, also another uh, core element. And uh, my, um, uh, one of my last points is investment. We cannot consider digital uh, education as a tool to make budget cuts. This is already happening, this is already a reality, but in order to ensure quality education, we need investment. And in order to, to have this power to move forward, we need cooperation. We need cooperation among the, cre the companies who create the systems, who create the tool. We need cooperation with how we, we were mentioning in the beginning, with the actors that leave education at the front for. And always bear in mind that education is just not a little part of our life. Education has an enormous impact on our future, on our full fulfillment as people, as individuals. So these are, from my side, the key elements for a, a, a high quality education for all. And I want to hand the, the same question to Rodrigo, if um, we can, yeah, you can hear us, right? Perfect. All right. In your opinion, if you look um, more into the future of digital uh, education, what are, in your opinion, the key elements that we need to build on? Well, uh, I think that, and going back, one that I am always very worried is because nothing works without the infrastructure. And so one key element is making sure we have the digital infrastructure for all. And this is not just, and I give you the case of Portugal, we are using most of the funds from the, the Recover and Resilience Plans, European funds, to create that infrastructure. But the challenge is then keeping it running as it should. The second uh, key element to, to rebuild, and I think this one is very important because as several people had said, uh, digitalization is not an aim in itself, is that there needs to be school-based digital action plans. So schools have their own pedagogical pro, uh, projects. It's very important that they rethink their pedagogical projects, taking into, into consideration digitalization. And so school-based action plans. The third key element, I would say, is to make sure in all our plans and in all our actions that we are focused on whole child development. And so the issue about digitalization is education is not about, or it's not mainly about students learning more math or more mother tongue or more geography. It's about a whole education process. And so digitalization in schools means learning more, but it means communicating better. It means new way of expressing oneself. It means new ways of thinking about the world, about interacting with others. And so all dimensions 
of a human being, of a round human being, must be taken in consideration when speaking about digitalization. And fourth element of change is when we really integrate digitalization in education, then our traditional systemic approaches, be it at the national level or the regional level, to the education system as a whole, also need to change. Uh, we still, in most European countries, think about education as this system with a ministry and a municipality and the schools and the teachers all working in a coordinated or more or less centrally coordinating way. Well, digitalization means people have more voice. And if people have more voice, then we become more of a network of different schools and different teachers uh, working through a common goal. And so I think that digitalization also has a key element in new ways of regulating what we are doing. And there is a lot of work being done at the European level, not strictly thinking about compulsory education levels, but still, when we think about micro-credentials, when we think about way of recognizing study periods abroad, when it's all about us understanding that we live in a much more global and complex and interactive world. Digital tools may allow us to do this in a, a more efficient way. So no longer one big system, but a lot of people educating, being educated, and just having a track record that can be recognized elsewhere. And so I think there is here a lot of opportunity to go forward. And, and I end by stressing again, because it is very important that we really think about big data and data protection in education, especially because we will need to learn to have more data about how youngsters learn, but we have to make really sure that uh, we do not create gigantic data databases about people, about young people. Thank you very much for this um, very important aspect that you mentioned. And I want to hand uh, the same question to Samira, in your opinion, the key elements. Please uh, tell us more. Thank you, Anne. Um, I can only agree with my, what has been said with my, uh, by my colleagues and also Rodrigo. Um, investment is, is key sustainable and adequate uh, investment because as we have seen uh, with regards to digital infrastructure, with regards to digital uh, skills and tools, there's been differences uh, within European countries. So like differences uh, between regions, uh, between uh, cities in the periphery, for example, uh, but also between uh, European countries as such. And we have to really bridge uh, these differences um, to really um, merge um, to, to really create, uh, to, to build this bridge uh, with uh, adequate uh, investment. And we have now, uh, we're now heading out of this pandemic. Um, we now have this, this data also available, uh, quantitative, qualitative, and we only have to go out there and, and talk to people. And this is also our goal, that we talk to people, that we bring as much people on board, um, within the, the school context, uh, so that, as you also saw uh, in the eSpeed video, that we go um, to, to schools, to teachers, to school leaders, to, to ask, uh, to, to really um, um, take them where they are, so to, to really ask them uh, about their experience, their daily experiences, and to also um, communicate this, this experience outside, to really raise awareness to them, to communicate also with external stakeholders um, like NGOs, like researchers, um, like ICTE uh, companies, and to really also foster this, uh, this cooperation in the future. Mm -hmm. Because as we have also heard, um, it's about people. People are at the center of education. And um, digital tools are, uh, like also Rodrigo said, an additional tool. Uh, which can help us to really enhance the quality um, uh, of education, to make it more innovative, to make it more uh, inclusive, to make it more prepared for the future. 
um, in this regard, um, as the European Federation of, Edu of Education, we, for example, um, cooperated with the Commission in the framework of the um, Digital Education Hub, which is um, a, a measure, um, like a, a tool within the digital education um, action plan, um, which aims to, to foster the, the cooperation uh, Europe-wide between uh, stakeholders in a uh, top-down, but which is also more important, bottom-up approach. This is an approach which uh, will become even more important in the future. Um, and um, so this is one aspect, but also uh, that we ourselves um, uh, do uh, everything to, to set up projects, to, to bring people on board, to create this platform. For example, in the future, uh, now that we have like the, the eSpeed project concluding uh, this year, um, we're thinking about a project which, uh, which aims at fostering the emergence of new inclusive pedagogies uh, by means of the, the use of digital tools um, in order to really bring this innovation to, um, to to foster this innovation in, the, in, in school management, in teaching, in learning. And we're very much uh, looking forward to that and uh, also encourage you to, to stay updated, uh, for, our, uh, for example, on our um, uh, website, uh, EFI, uh, but also we have uh, Twitter where we uh, regularly uh, update uh, news with regards to activities which we conduct. Thank you very much, Samira. And um, as you said, people are in the center of education and also in the center of digitalization. We also center you, the audience, a little bit more and give you the opportunity to participate in our discussion. Feel free to ask uh, questions or to share your own perspective on the questions that we discussed. There's a question here. Microphone is coming. Thank you. I have a question to Ruben. Um, I'm part of a, a small team at the University of Copenhagen and we are currently looking into opportunities but also risks of learning analytics. And I, I noticed that you were mentioning big data and learning analytics. So um, you also said that students should at all times be the owners of their own data. So my question to you would be um, what kind of advice, advice would you give me? How would um, how could, could you elaborate a little bit on an approach that centers the students and gives the students the data they need, but at the same time grants them the ownership of their own data? What would you advise me from a student perspective? Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for that question because I'm I, uh, really happy to talk a little bit more about this topic because it's so important and so, yeah, it's going to gain a lot of importance in the coming years. Um, I think. Like I said, there's a two big concerns. There's on one side the data security and the privacy and the ethical concern, and the other side the pedagogical concern. Now about the data, like I said, students should be the owner of their data at all times. So um, I think first of all about uh, active consent. So the students should at all times know what of their data is being collected and should actually actively give their consent that that data is being collected. And that also uh, with that they actually know what the data is being used for and who has access for this. Um, second is that they, uh, the data should not be shared with third parties. I think that's a very clear one, uh, that everybody knows, okay, this data is being collected, being used by teachers, by the education institution, but will not leave the institution. Um, and third, as far as is possible, the data should be anonymized and aggregated because, of course, that depends on what exactly you want to do with the data, but if it's uh, in order to learn about um, uh, the gain insights from uh, the data about the education, well, the, the, the learning process of the students and to use this to actually improve the learning process from the point of view of a teacher, of a, a learning developer, um, then you don't need to know who that data belongs to. Uh, of course, when it goes, you really want to individualize the student experience and give them a more personalized learning path, uh, then you need, of course, to, to still have that personal connection. Uh, but then it's really about thinking who should have access to which data, uh, because in in a lot of those learning management uh, systems uh, that I have experience with, um, a teacher can see basically everything, uh, which is really not the goal, uh, because we need to think about as well how should the teacher be able to use this data, uh, especially in terms of assessment, and that's really important to gain the trust between the students uh, and the teachers themselves. Um, 
So that's that's the one side on the uh, the data side and on the pedagogical side, um, we've also got a lot of thoughts and, and values about that. And most of all, the data should be used, like I said, to uh, improve the learning process um, and to gain insights and to maybe personalize the experience, but never to deny a student access or opportunities. Uh, you should, we should never be put in a world uh, where automatically, based on data, a decision is made, okay, this door closes for you as a student. Um, rather, uh, we need to use this for personalizing, but always the student, the personal perspective should be put central. Uh, we can, for example, use data uh, analytics, learning analytics to guide the student in their uh, learning path. Uh, uh, really their learning career through an entire program, uh, but that should always be accompanied with a face-to-face -face conversation with an actual person looking at the data and talking with the uh, students uh, themselves. So in general, what's really important is to keep the conversation going between all the parties. Uh, so uh, like you're saying, you're thinking about uh, employing this technology at your uh, institution. Uh, well, the most important thing that I would advise is have a conversation with the students, say, okay, we've got these tools, we're thinking about doing this. Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, what would you find useful? Uh, what would be important for you? And to have that conversation as well with all the teachers and then also see what tools are available and what tools actually answer to those constraints. Because that's like, I said one of the big things that uh, I've seen uh, people bump into as well. Okay, we've got all, all these values and we agree that we should have this uh, privacy and pedagogical uh, restraints, but we're not actually able to implement those with the tools that we have. Uh, so that's another big one, uh, but I think one that really needs to be put at the center, especially when you're deciding which tool to use. So I hope that's kind of a bit of uh, useful information, uh, but that's, that's the most important thing, I think. Thank you very much for the question and the answer. Are there any further questions or comments? We have a little bit more time. We have like 10 minutes more if you like to ask uh, questions or address something that you wanted to. Yeah, there is another question. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Um, what I uh, hear, uh, hear in, this, uh, in your talks, and thank you all for your uh, input, that's really nice. Um, I hear a lot of uh, uh, student-centered approaches. So the student in the new pedagogy should be uh, central. Um, uh, also in the digital learning environment, I'd say. Uh, but what we see at our university uh, is that uh, all of our programs are uh, developing towards a more student-centered uh, curriculum. Um, but the digital learning environment and all of the tools uh, present uh, today at this Congress as well don't really support, really support student-centered pedagogies. So there's a bit of a constraint. And we talk with the, the market, uh, the European market. We talk with all of the tools. We would like to collaborate more with the tools. But there are some constraints. They are creating their tools for the current market. And not all of the universities uh, are uh, mainly using the student-centered approach. So it feels like we're... Uh, we have these needs and we have our wishes and we want to have more student-centered pedagogies, but um, our call doesn't seem to be hear heard. Um, so therefore I'm asking you as student and also teacher representatives uh, with a, for, for large quantities of students and lecturers, what, is, uh, what are you going to do to move the market in a more student-centered direction? Thank you very much for this question, and I might just hand it to all our panelists. Where whoever wants to elaborate a little bit can use our, make use of our time. May I? Yes. Hello? Yeah, Rodrigo. Yes. It's your okay. turn, if you like. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, so very quickly, I would just like to make, uh, make clear one thing I think is important. A student-centered approach in teaching and learning is not something that is possible because of digital tools. We have had some universities and some basic and secondary schools with student-centered approaches for centuries, you know? And so what is new with the digital world at, is that we have tools that make this even easier. So what we really need is a cultural mind shift. And so uh, schools, universities, teachers need to do the cultural change and really understand, look, in the old days, you had the excuse that it was difficult to access information. In the new world, information is ubiquitous. So it's just an excuse. You do not need to lecture 
uh, young students or older students because they can find that information online. And so really it's more of a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. Secondly, if just very briefly, I would like to comment something on the previous question. It's that I think we have here two things when speaking about artificial intelligence and personalized learning and so on. One thing that I think is easier because of the privacy laws and everything is that we need enough data on how people learn so we can develop the uh, right softwares and the right teaching uh, uh, application softwares, whatever. And that we can do with anonymized data. We just need a lot of data about how a four-year-old or a five or a six or a 20 learn uh, mathematics or geography or law or whatever. And that, so that's all about anonymized data. I don't think we have a personal data problem. We just have how can we get all this data together. A second issue, and that one I think is not in the near future, but has really acute personal data problems is when we think about collecting data about one person and using that data to personalize uh, teaching, uh, online teaching for that person. But that I think is a challenge still far off <laughs> in the future. I think it's possible for the first part is getting uh, good online tutoring algorithms that will work with anonymized data. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Um, stuck with me is also that you mentioned again how we need to help teachers also to um, yeah, um, change or develop their own teaching process and um, not being stuck on the transmissional teaching strategies, but switch more to constructivist approaches, of course. Yeah, right. Um, does someone of uh, the panelists want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I will make a couple of comments on both questions. Um, so uh, I, I believe uh, that the potential of digital tools should be explored from the very beginning of uh, the teaching edu for teachers' education. So uh, what we have now, and Anne is a, a teacher as well, uh, you don't have uh, uh, the real uh, awareness of how can you uh, best um, uh, explore uh, the benefit of digital tools from the very beginning of your career. And that's why in many occasions there is the blaming against teachers that teachers don't have uh, the right culture toward digitalization or they, they are opposing digitalization. Well, th this is about a, a lot about skills. And in many cases, not just uh, initial, uh, initial education, but also continuous professional development, because what you've learned two decades ago cannot be up to date after, uh, after 20 years. Uh, I do believe there is also an important gap between the, uh, the field, like the, the good practices, and what is actually uh, perceived from uh, from a teacher level, uh, but also uh, from, from the school level, from the education institution level. At the same time, um, I imagine that if, as a school, you don't have uh, the sufficient tool, and on this maybe Samir would be able to tell us more, if you don't have the sufficient finding of, uh, fundings for um, implementing a good use of digitalization in education, well, you will opt for a, a common software to allow teachers to teach in the same way they've always done uh, so, so far, because what we're seeing today, it, it's, you know, old pedagogies with new tools, but simply this is not going to work. And concerning the use of data, um, I totally agree with what was shared by, um, by Ruben. Uh, I also believe uh, that uh, we have a problem of regulation. Um, when looking at the new uh, proposal for regulation on AI, uh, there is no linkage with the GDPR, which is actually a, a great tool uh, for all workers, and in this case, uh, users, uh, to understand which are their rights regarding the use of, of their own data. 
And if we want to build a, um, a human-centered approach toward uh, data collection, I do believe that we also need to raise the awareness, in this case of teachers and students, of how their data is used. Because we are not selling our data, we are giving up our data. And the reason why we cannot have a market of personal data is that because, as users, many times we are not aware of the value of that data. So any time we click on I consent, we actually are not even aware of what we are giving up. So I do believe that should be one of the key elements of, of this strategy as well. Thank you very much, Martina. Um, does someone want to add something? We have two more minutes, and I see no hand raised for questions. So I yeah, hand over I'd to like you. I'd like to shortly uh, uh, add as well to the answers that are already given uh, to your questions. I think it's a really important question, uh, and I'd also be interested to, to hear what it exactly means for you that you want to implement the student-centered approach, but other tools are not offering this. Um, now, you asked, like, what are we doing uh, to actually make that a reality, that we can do that with the digital tools? Well, I think of three things. One is we really need to clearly redefine what does a student-centered approach mean, uh, because it's been a very uh, much used uh, term in the last decade, two decades in higher education, but it's also gotten a very, to be a very big and vague term that everybody kind of has their own interpretation uh, to what it is. So if I would summarize in a nutshell, what is a student-centered approach? That, that is that we are not looking at, when, when designing learning and teaching, we're not looking at the input, as in we start from what do we want to teach the students, but rather we look at the output as to uh, what learning outcomes do we want the learners to actually achieve? And they were going to design everything around that to make sure that the students with their own needs and context actually achieve those learning outcomes. So that's one thing, clearly redefining and making sure that everybody knows what does a student-centered approach really entail and how do we get there. Second is kind of what was already said by uh, my predecessors as well, um, is if we're not able to do that with the tools that we have, then we just have to do it a different way. Just because, like we've said it quite a few times, the digital tools are only tools. Um, so if we want to achieve student-centered learning, then what do we have to do? We have to design our pedagogical approach in such a way that it is student-centered learning. And we we should use digital tools wherever we can, uh, but not more. Uh, like if, we, if it doesn't fit what we want to do, then we have to do it a different way. Um, so the, the core should always be designing the pedagogy and the digital tools, uh, they, they come later to actually better achieve those outcomes that we want. And the third thing is really to collaborate. Uh, we're having this discussion right now and I think that's an incredibly important thing, uh, but we also have to do that within the institutions like we've said much before, but also uh, with different institutions together and with students uh, and teachers and staff together and then if, if you're a bit stronger, if you've got a, a quite a wide area of the, the, the users, the potential users of those digital tools, we're at a bit of a stronger position to actually talk to it at the companies and to anybody who's developing those tools and doing research on it uh, to have a real conversation on what, what we want. So I think that's an incredibly important thing as well to make sure that in the end we get more student-centered tools that really allow us to do what we want to do in an edu education institution. Thank you very much. Samira, do you want to add something in the end? So I, I didn't want to make um, a finalist round, so I will give you the chance to add something in the end. Thank you, Anne. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just want to say that um, I think we have uh, this discussion also shows because we have so many ideas, we have so many um, things we can work on. There's uh, great... Uh, possibilities laying ahead of us, um, also with regards to the school um, a whole school approach, which, which has been mentioned quite, quite often uh, during the discussion. Also what um, Martina said with regards to um, making pedagogies more innovative, uh, also with regards to content from a very early start. I think there's a lot we can work on, a lot we can explore. And um, we're looking forward to, to do this uh, together with a lot of stakeholders and um, also to, to build trust in this regard, to make uh, education really innovative, to make it really uh, future-oriented, to give um, everyone the, the chance to explore and um, create something, because that's what education is about, creating something together and um, also bringing new ideas ahead um, and uh, thinking about the future. 
Thank you for providing us with this um, important take-home message. And I want to thank um, the audience as well, as well as the panelists. Thank you for sharing this discussion with us. And I wish you all um, a good day and um, yeah, more inspiration. Thanks a lot. Thank you.